Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another Reuters events webinar. Uh, this is for climate leaders in the investment community. Uh, we're joined by um, Oliver Wyman and UBS today. Um, the format will be that James will give a short presentation on behalf of Oliver Wyman um, before Chris and Francis give a brief introduction to themselves and their work. And then we will dive into a question and answer session. So please do feel free to submit your questions throughout throughout um, James's presentation and we will make sure to get to as many of them at the end as possible. Um, just a quick note to say that unfortunately Aberdeen Standard Investments and Eva um, won't be able to join us today and it's a sort of a scary reminder of the current situation that we're in globally. Um, it's that unfortunately Eva has come down with, um, with an illness and, and so um, sensibly she is um, resting and, and taking her rest. So um, without further ado I'd like to hand over to James who can start the presentation. James. Thank you Dom and, and thank you all for joining. Um, I'll give a few introductory uh, remarks um, by way of introduction of myself. I'm, I'm a partner in our um, financial services business at Oliver Wyman uh, and I'm one of the, the team focused on sustainable finance and, and climate change uh, within the financial services sector. So we'll dive into the into a, a few pages we pulled together just to just to get get kicked off. Um, you know, we sort of stepped back and thought about what does climate change mean for financial services, and, and bucketed three broad imperatives um, that we think financial institutions of all shapes and sizes need to be acting on. Um, the first is acting on the risks, um, and what does that mean? That means starting to understand you know, where are the physical risks, uh, where are the transition risks. You know, what might those look like? How do we quantify those? And in most cases, that means some form of, of systematic scenario analysis. And then particularly, how do we start to act on those? Because this is a complex risk to understand. There's many um, unknowns as you try and model it. And it's very easy to, to, for that complexity to become um, uh, stupefying. Uh, and so the challenge really is to say, how do we take the learnings from those experimental studies and start to apply them and embed them in the way we make portfolio decisions and the way we make origination decisions and the way we think about return in, 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 in the sector. The second imperative um, focused much more on the opportunity side and there's really two um, trends that underpin that. One is the rapid growth in ESG investing um, and you know, we can all see that in the numbers and, and that's underpinned by both sort of uh, high net worth and sophisticated investors, um, institutional investors, as well as increasingly you know, retail investors. Um, and the other big trend is, is transition itself and a you know, growing realization amongst many corporations and governments that there is a, a growing need to act um, and, and a huge need to accelerate progress. And that will require a lot of financing, um, a lot of new investment, and that clearly creates opportunities for those um, providing that, that investment. Um, and then the third um, imperative is, is more of a, I suppose, a moral argument and a, and a question of, you know, as custodians of, of, um, of savers' uh, monies uh, and as um, you know, a core part of the functioning of the economy, what, what proactive role can financial institutions take, you know, going beyond the, the, the sheer commercial imperative that drives the first two of these, you know, where is it appropriate for financial institutions? To, to go beyond the immediate financial um, calculus and start you know, proactively steering capital towards um, greener uh, and transition um, topics. So we'll drill into a few of those just to give a bit more color in each of those before we open up to the panel. Um, page, page three looks at, at the risk question and, and summarizes some analysis that, that we did in Oliver Wyman looking at the potential impact of a carbon tax. Um, and this is building on work that we did with UNEP, working primarily with with banks, uh, and we've been rolling out this kind of work um, as the banking sector has, you know, partly embraced it of their own accord and partly been encouraged to do so by regulators like the Bank of England uh, here in the UK. Um, and, and so, what this analysis does is we went detail, we went sort of uh, counterparty by counterparty within um, the sort of high carbon oil and gas and power sectors, uh, and just modelled out, you know, what what would that look like? For, uh, and a couple of conclusions came out. You know, one is, you know, overall. Um, the, the impact is material. So in, in the sort of banking speak, you know, for, for the most impacted bank here, it's a sort of 3% impact on the CET1 ratio, you know, in the extreme, we model that a relatively extreme scenario of a sudden imposition of a carbon tax. 
Um, the other key finding was that this is very much a, a granular exercise and there's a big difference between individual counterparties within a sector. It's not sufficient to simply you know, tar whole sectors with the same brush. The underlying financial health of the counterparty is very important in determining their resilience, um, but even more so the, the, the business mix and the nature of the energy mix in, in this case uh, is a critical determinant of how impacted they are. And so I think, you know, where is good practice today, you know, the work that we're doing is very much focused on you know, building out some of these measurement approaches, but then pushing that and embedding that into decision making processes right at the, the heart of financial institutions. And this, very, this is very much something uh, that, that's analogous in, in the insurance sector and in many of the, the sort of asset managing uh, activities as well. On, on the opportunity side, you know, in the paper that we wrote recently, we put out some sizing around this and, and we estimated it was something like 100 to $150 billion of, of new revenue growth you know, in the sustainable uh, finance space broadly defined. Uh, and of course, some of this will be substitu substitution of existing activities. Um, but, you know, in any event, um, this is one of the more interesting growth areas in the financial services uh, sector in, in an environment where you know, the current stress and, and, and pressure notwithstanding, you know, the, um, the industry has been facing a long period uh, short, of, short of growth opportunities. And so we broke out three pillars to this. One is the saving and investing side, which is you know, primarily captured by asset and wealth managers and distributors and manufacturers of investing products, but also uh, the sell side and, and other players will, will play in this pool as well. The financing space, um, which is you know, today, things like green bonds and specific uh, green financing instruments, but really needs to extend into a much broader uh, marketplace to finance the transition um, and tackle those counterparties that, that sit between you know, pure green uh, and pure brown. And then underpinning all of that, the sort of content and risk transfer space. So all of this activity uh, and the risk management side requires new data uh, and new analytical products um, to support that. And there's obviously a battle between you know, the data providers, the exchange groups, and then, um, you know, asset managers, banks themselves as to, you know, who's the right owner of which pieces of that value chain, who, who should be collecting the data, standardizing it, and who should be embedding what level of analytics on top of that, and how much of that analytics is, is proprietary versus standardized across the industry. And then on the, on the last uh, question here around, you know, the more uh, ambitious, you know, stretching goal for, for the industry, you know, we, we have a framework here which we've used, you know, with a number of different types of companies outside of the financial services sector, which really says if you, if you want to be more proactive on, 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 on this, what does that mean? And it particularly means a, a sort of shift in mindset from saying, you know, what do I have to do? What am I compelled to do by regulation and by the sort of immediate commercial imperative? towards a more sort of proactive um, approach, engaging with stakeholders in different industries and different groups to try and you know, create new markets and new ways of working and try and um, tackle uh, some of these issues uh, proactively. And certainly, I think the financial services sector, when we when we work with, with other industries, is, is viewed as a key enabler and a key um, sort of accelerator uh, for the wider effort of, of transition. So that's um, all I wanted to say in terms of introdu introductory comments. Hopefully that's useful just to, just to frame um, the space we're talking about. Um, page six just sets out some introductory questions that we're, we're hoping to explore in, in the discussion, but hopefully I'll be serving primarily questions uh, from the group um, to the panelists today. So I'll pause there and, and hand over uh, to Chris and, and, and Francis to, to introduce themselves. Great, thanks, James. Um, yes, my name is Christopher Greenwald. I'm heading Sustainable Investment Research and Stewardship at UBS Asset Management, uh, which is a team that works um, across asset classes on integrating sustainability into the investment process. Um, and climate is obviously one of the key topics that's been driving integration um, bottom up, but also increasingly, um, one of the key topics that we're seeing requests from from clients in terms of uh, integrating sustainability into the investment process but also coming up with focused solutions um, around uh, climate risk um, and new products uh, to be able to address those issues and uh, i'm from yeah thanks chris i'm francis condon i'm a a senior sustainable investing research analyst with UBS Asset Management. So 
I'm a member of, uh, of uh, Chris's team. I have uh, specialities or specialisms around um, in terms of sectors looking at uh, extractive industries, so oil and gas and mining, um, and the utility sector. So um, that perhaps is my way in um, to climate change, but I've also, um, over the last few years, been involved in the discussion in various areas um, around the intersection between investment and climate change. So I'm um, uh, looking to forward to sharing some insights on this call. Great. So to kick us off, um, should we start by by addressing some of the questions here? Um, I mean, how how would you think uh, of what needs to be done to stay ahead of the market uh, and get a thorough understanding of the of the fundamental drivers that are influencing change? I'll I'll take that one, James. So it's, it's Francis here. Um, yeah, I mean, there's obviously. When you look at climate change, um, there's a lot that needs to happen. There are uncertainties about how that will happen and when it will happen. And so, uh, but all of, and, and it has to happen. It's not, there's no sort of single solution here. It has to be a variety of actions that are happening in all sorts of areas and all sorts, all sorts of segments. So, it's governmental and it's societal, but it's also um, in terms of corporate. So it, it becomes a, a, a factor when, a particular factor when we're looking at sort of equity and fixed income investment. So the moment we start to think about fundamental and we start to think about materiality, I think that gets us into the, into the issue of um, overall ESG integration. So this is how uh, UBS asset management is taking the whole um, spectrum of environmental, social and governance issues and working those through in terms of how, how do we identify what's material and what works through to the investment decision and then how do we make decisions based upon it. And clearly climate change is a significant issue um, in all of that, um, affecting a wide range of sectors in various different ways. So when we think about uh, fundamental drivers of, of, of climate change transition, we are thinking about regulatory risks. Uh, you, you talked in your slide presentation about a scenario of a, of a uh, sudden imposition of carbon tax. You know, we have to think about that, or perhaps about probabilities and scale. Um, we think about um, commercial risks. So is there a potential move away from products with high carbon or energy intensity, and talking also about technology risks, many of which are happening on a sort of longer term time frame, um, but they do sort of hang over investment cases in terms of understanding substitution of process products and services, and then perhaps further out physical risk, and, and, and maybe we'll talk about that a bit later. But if you, if we sort of, if you look at that, then the fundamental issues, even just of regulatory risk, are sort of falling in a variety of sectors. Uh, energy and electric utilities come to mind, you know, immediately. You might think also about metals and mining to the extent that obviously there is coal mining in there, but also the very large emitters like the steel industry, but also food and beverage, chemicals, construction materials, automotive, aerospace, and um, it's it's. Getting ahead of this, staying ahead of this market is about understanding what happens at each, for us, about understanding what happens at each of these levels uh, in these sectors dependent on things like business model, uh, competitive position, the location of the assets of an individual uh, company or issuer, uh, regulatory jurisdictions, um, technologies and innovation among other factors. So uh, staying ahead is, a, is, is also about getting deeper into this question about what is what is a fundamental driver and what is material at the individual investment case. I have a question from from the from the uh, from the community here. Um, if you imagine a specific example here, uh, creating a pilot zero waste village as a sort of human laboratories uh, to, to, to work through an experiment, how that could work 
more broadly. You know, is, is that the kind of thing that ESG investing can help finance and make happen? Is, is that the kind of, do you see a role for ESG investing in, 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 in that kind of project? Uh, when we when we talk about so UBS asset management is is, is a business that's principally servicing uh, institutional investors, and we have uh, wholesale activities also in conjunction with the UBS wealth management business. So when when we're looking at it from our perspective, we are uh, starting with uh, capital markets, and we're talking about um, equity investments and fixed income investments of the various varieties. So I think the first challenge in that example is how do we connect uh, our activities to uh, the activities of capital markets to that particular example. Um, it's not easy to see that connection. It may happen through an individual corporate. So this could be uh, a project that is being undertaken in, in partnership uh, with a corporate. It's, it's more likely that this sort of fits a bit more in the impact side. Um, and so fits, we do have an impact uh, product, um, but it may also fit um, into, into specific and targeted impact funds. So funds who are investing in specific projects of exactly this, that nature. Um, if there's a business model in there that does not manage to achieve a, a financial return, then it may well be that it's sort of more in the philanthropic area and our, and our colleagues in wealth management are um, uh, have created frameworks to have discussions around philanthropy uh, with their clients. Okay, so pivoting then back to the more of the, the transition space, you know, what, what sort of tools and techniques um, do you have in mind or do you see as being useful to think about measuring carbon metrics in the investment space? How do you select the right metrics to look at um, for, for investment decisions? Um, so we are um, we're looking we, we we sort of get as I say we get into a range of metrics depending on and, and what's material for individual sectors. I mean I mean the sort of metrics that we'll, we we look at from the climate spaces clearly we'll look at, at carbon emissions. Uh, there is now I think a well developed technique of taking. Uh, the carbon emissions of individual corporate issuers, attributing them to a portfolio, and that allows um, investors to aggregate that up uh, to create a, a carbon footprint for a portfolio. If we can, if we, in our reporting, we can um, compare that to benchmark. Uh, we can we can sort of show how that has evolved over time, and we can sort of identify the sort of top ten contributors to. Uh, the carbon emissions of the portfolio. So that's sort of reasonably tied, uh, tried and, and tested, and we, we have data providers out there who have their own ways of, of aggregating reported carbon emissions and estimating for those companies who sadly still don't disclose uh, their carbon emissions. So that's a starting point, but um, it, it sort of goes somewhere. It has its limitations, its limitations are that it tends to be a little bit backward looking, um, so it's not taking into account the, the, the sort of cut the metrics or the, the targets and commitments that companies are making. There is this degree of estimation um, in there, and 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 it doesn't, you know, in a sense, it doesn't always get to the heart of what is 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 climate risk. It it, it focuses on carbon pricing as one of the regulatory risks, but it doesn't get to the heart of climate risk. So. What we what we look in, look to do is to sort of go uh, beyond those sorts of measures. Uh, at that stage, the, the metrics become a little bit uh, more difficult to get hold of, or they become sector specific. Um, and so um, we we're, we're sort of going beyond that. We're looking at, um, as I say, what's material to a sector. So if we're looking at an oil and gas company. Um, it might be around the size of the upstream business, the, the scale of the refining business. Uh, we'll be talking to them about strategy and about their plans um, going forward and, and where does sort of uh, a lower carbon economy fit into, into strategy. Um, if we're talking to a construction materials business or let's say a, a steel business, that is much more about emissions. 
So it will be about capex and will be, be about technologies and those sorts of things. And if we're talking to, um, uh, for instance, a, a food and beverage business, it might be something related, a conversation related to, to the supply chain. So I don't think there is a sort of single number, single metric that necessarily uh, gives us that answer. Um, there are methodologies that data providers can provide that will you know, variously weight some of these uh, indicators. We do look at those as, as potentially interesting, uh, um, interesting tools going forward. Yeah, I guess I would just add to what Francis said there. I mean, I think that the, the, we're pretty good in terms of understanding the current uh, CO2 footprints of companies, and we have good metrics across most mid and large cap companies to be able to do that. Where um, we really need to do more work in the industry is to think about the forward-looking metrics of where companies are going. And, um, and in order to understand the future climate risk using objective data points, um, so within our own strategies, we've developed um, a framework that we call a glide path probability score, where we're looking at not only the current CO2 emissions levels of corporates, but their ability to reduce emissions over time. And then we project that into the future within their industry context in relationship to the um, International Energy Association estimates of where each industry needs to be to be on at least a two degree glide path of CO2 emissions reduction. And this gives us, using historical data, at least a projection of the probability that companies are in line uh, with a Paris Agreement scenario. And I think one of the great promises of initiatives such as uh, the TCFD, uh, Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, is to get more forward-looking reporting and more reporting at strategy level, how business models are being impacted by climate risk, because that's probably the most important element that investors um, want to and need to consider when thinking about valuation models in relationship to uh, climate change. Just building on that, I have a couple of questions from that come in around scope three emissions. Um, and you know, one, one a general question of how do you see that being taken into account in these kind of frameworks and then specifically you know, do you see that um, being an important driver for companies to, to get their own supply chains less carbon intensive uh, and the other sort of specific question within that was around you know thinking about that in terms of how you appraise um, say a renewable uh, energy project you know for example if a, if a solar farm is built consuming a, a significant amount of carbon and then the transportation to and from it uh, you know also emits carbon how should that all be factored in uh, yeah so, so why don't I have a go at that one um, yeah so when we talk about carbon footprinting data the really solid ground here is is the scope one and scope two emissions it's it's they're very so scope one being the direct emissions a bit like me driving my car or it could be and scope two is electric purchases. So what I, in a sense, with the carbon emissions associated with, with the electricity I buy to run my house. Um, scope three is a, is, a, is a much more complicated beast, um, in all honesty. Um, there are 15 different categories for it. There are different levels of what is material at different sectors. And overall, uh, currently disclosure, Corporate disclosure on scope three emissions is still um, is much smaller than it is um, in the other two scopes. So, so one of the challenges at the moment is data quality. Uh, if we could sort that out, then scope three is an incredibly interesting metric um, because it starts to talk to where companies have some sort of influence or buying in or selling out. Uh, carbon emissions somewhere else in their value chain. So um, for an agricultural company, for instance, then it might be that a lot of the carbon emissions are actually uh, upstream, so they're coming from the raw material suppliers. Let's think about, um, for instance, beef into a, into a food value chain. Uh, there's a lot of methane emissions associated, and deforestation associated with beef production. So um, that's the upstream piece. Uh, but unfortunately, that only accounts for about eight of the 15 categories. 
Um, and uh, we have also have the downstream uh, measures. And it could be that there are companies for whom scope three is much more important uh, in the downstream areas, and, and in particular around issues of, of processing of product. So if we look at some of the metals and mining companies who are working on scope three data, you'll see that there's large amounts of emissions associated with the processing of their um, iron ore production. Um, and also uh, the aluminium um, in the aluminium value chain. So you've got processing. You've also got for the fossil fuel producers the effect of having their their products um, in effect burned, so that we can generate um, energy in different forms. So it's illuminating. So scope three is a really really interesting area to get into, and it says something different to just the in effect what's just inside the fence line. Of a company's operations, but the challenge is is um, getting to sort of consistent understanding of what we're doing. There are different ways of calculating scope three, um, and uh, getting to a, uh, an area where we have you know consistent and comparable quality data to work. With. Yeah, I guess just echoing what Francis is saying. I mean, I think scope three is less useful as a quantitative metric that you can compare across companies given the differences in calculating scope three emissions that Francis mentioned, which makes comparability of data a challenge. Um, and oftentimes uh, we find that companies with higher scope three emissions are those that just have a more comprehensive accounting of scope three. So you really have to look at what the company is including and take the actual reported numbers uh, with a grain of salt. I think they're more act they're more informative in terms of business risk and thinking about from a corporate perspective what the business risk is of a transition to a low carbon economy. And so higher levels of scope three emissions in the downstream product usage um, is a risk indicator that as those clients switch to uh, low carbon alternatives, the company's own business model is at risk. And so Thinking about the implications in terms of the product mix and the future direction of how they orient the strategy is probably the most useful application of scope three emissions to corporates. Just, just, build, just staying with this question around you know, measuring and understanding you know, transition risk. We've had a few questions come in around climate change scenarios. What, what scenarios should one use to base uh, their actions on, you know, in my introductory slides, we talked about a carbon tax as one scenario. That's certainly something that we've modeled out a few different times. Certainly in our experience, we found lots of different financial institutions are using different, um, you know, approaches and have, a, have a, you know, some choice of different uh, scenarios they can tap into the academic community and the policy world to, to, and they can choose, you know, how they structure that. Do you, do you see standardization emerging around scenarios or do you have particular scenarios that you like to, to rely on when you're thinking through, through transition risks? Um, yeah, so there is, I think there is some, there's certainly a discussion going on around scenarios and, and you know, we're members of the Institutional Investor Group on Climate Change. So about, what is it now, 15 or 16 months ago, they published a paper on sort of navigating scenario analysis. So you can find that on the IIGCC website. And um, we've seen other um, sort of partnership bodies working on the question of scenarios. And there is an ongoing piece of work, again, at I, in IIGCC about, you know, a discussion around what Paris alignment might, might actually look like. Um, there's a lot, so there's a number of scenarios, a lot of scenarios out there on, on climate change, a number of quantitative scenarios out there, but, the, but there's a lot of convergence at the moment around IEA scenarios. We use it in our climate aware strategy. And the reason why we do that is because um, it has a, a two degree and a, a below two degree pathway in there but it also so it, it sort of talks in the global terms about how we get to uh, a paris towards a, a paris world um, a low carbon a, a low carbon economy but it also has the level of granularity that there's data in there that investors can actually use so um as chris mentioned there are they're, they're sort of you know we're looking at it at individual 
uh, sector level, and that's what an IEA scenario gives you. So, that, so the the thing is, is there's a lot of scenarios out there, but there's only a small number of them that are current, can currently be kind of shaped in a way that investors can easily use them. So there's a lot of convergence around IEA, and that's something that I think the industry in the coming years will be looking at. Is, is IEA the only provider? Are there other scenarios um, that we can look at? And what are the sort of um, framework parameters for um, the scenarios that we can we can actually use? Chris, did you want to add anything to that? All right, um, Francis. No, I think that that made sense. It's one of the key things we engage companies on um, when it comes to the TCFD. We use the TCFD as a framework when we're engaging with companies on climate risk issues, and um, getting them to engage in scenario analysis is one of the key requests that we have uh, for corporates. Um, as Francis mentioned, I think we see an emerging convergence around IEA, but um, there's still a, a fair amount of, um, I would say, confusion in terms of a, a single standard that companies can use when it comes to scenario analysis. But getting them to already think about it, um, conduct it, be transparent about the assumptions and include it in the reporting is one of our key asks uh, for companies uh, in line with uh, TCFD disclosure requirements. We had a few we had a few questions come in around around carbon pricing uh, and and carbon uh, as an asset in itself. So as obviously we've seen um, carbon pricing increasing substantially um, in the EU and the launch of carbon markets in a, in a bunch of other countries, including China, Mexico, the Philippines, Indonesia. So the question for the panel is, you know, do you see carbon pricing, you know, as an important part of the answer, and do you see it emerging as an investable asset class um, in its own right and something that could be valuable as a, as a hedge in, uh, in in portfolios? Um, we do see it as important. I mean, we think it's uh, a kind of a key tool when it comes to. Uh, the regulatory uh, levers for getting us onto a mo much more of a, a low carbon trajectory. So the benefit being, you know, carbon disincentivizes high carbon emissions and it incentivizes the deployment of low carbon technologies. And in some some of the companies we're talking to, uh, when they talk about when they go beyond um, the immediate actions that they can take. And a lot of it is about there's technology out there that we could use to make drastic, significant uh, further improvement in our, car in our carbon reduction, but they don't make economic sense unless there's a carbon price. So it's a, it's a, key, it's a key tool. It's not the only one, uh, but it's an important tool mm. in, in terms of what uh, governments, what we can do in terms uh, to respond to climate change. So the two challenges of that are the current carbon pricing mechanisms, uh, and you mentioned the EU and, and some other names, uh, 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 jurisdictions in there. But at the moment, they're only covering about 20% uh, of total global greenhouse gas emissions. So there, there's, a, a, there's a piece here where we need to see much greater coverage of of GHG emissions by carbon pricing mechanisms. So some of that is the scope of existing ones, but a lot of it is about other countries picking up this idea, or, or maybe countries, it may be individual provinces, it may be individual um, social units, but a greater coverage of greenhouse gas emissions by carbon pricing mechanism. And then, then the second one is that to get to um, two degrees, we need actually need much higher carbon prices themselves, so enough to incentivize these sort of uh, new and bubbling under low carbon technologies. So we've looked through a few scenarios to sort of see what carbon prices come up and, um, you know, given where we are now as well as about $25 a ton or something, uh, you know, the three degree scenarios all tend to show something around 
35 to 50 dollars a ton so there's a, a bit of an increase in that but the two degree scenarios ask for substantial uh, increase about 70 uh, we've seen a range of about 70 to 180 dollars a ton so um, we also need to see substantially higher carbon prices now how this works as a, a sort of hedging market um, I, I feel that's a little bit beyond my capabilities but one of the questions I would have about this is whether this the carbon market is, is ever liquid enough for the purposes of, of hedging but um, mm. that's about as far as I take it on the quickly because because while I sort of have a sense of carbon pricing markets it's used by investors that's a little bit beyond my, uh, my understanding but Chris would you have anything on that no, I mean, it, I, I don't see it as a key um, topic right now for investors, partly for the, the reasons that Francis mentioned in terms of the limited scope, um, not only in terms of the actual total global emissions, but just not having a standard globally that applies across geographies. So if that were to develop, I think that would probably raise the importance of, of carbon pricing for from an investment perspective, I think probably more um, on the minds of investors is the business model risk rather than the actual cost per company due to operational CO2 emissions. Um, and I think the anticipation is that we'll see uh, technological changes in industries such as automobiles that's going to put a much more uh, fundamental and faster pressure on fossil fuel companies than a carbon price. I have a few questions that are coming uh, around technology um, uh, and investments in technology. Uh, we, we recently worked on a, on a paper with the carbon disclosure project which revealed you know, how, far the, how far the gap is in terms of current levels of investment versus required levels of investment. Uh, and you know, I have one specific question in you know coming from the business community in, in in Boston. They're trying to think through how can private investment scale up public and other sources of funding, particularly when it comes to larger required system change like critical infrastructure, deep energy ret retrofits, grid modernization. How can businesses you know, trying to take on investments like that, you know, um, enable the investment community to help them catalyze processes? Okay, I think it's. Um, I mean, it's it, it's a challenge. It's you know we we talk here um, about public markets, and yet we've got here technology change, and so the processes of uh, research, development, sort of deployment and dispersion and dis dissemination. So, and public markets tend to come in at the end of that. They tend to be very good ways of providing finance through uh, corporates um, in the dissemination of uh, new technology. So there is a challenge in how to bring that kind of investment further further up in terms of the technology pipeline. Um, and I think this sort of gets us into the area of, um, of discussing partnership and how does that work um, in climate change uh, and um, uh, the extent to which something like the involvement of, um, of uh, public of corporations uh, uh, um, but also in conjunction with as you say private actors or infrastructure or longer term players um, and the role of for instance, uh, multilateral development banks who can take a slice of risk. There's, there's a conversation to be had here about how that, how that works from a technology uh, perspective. Um, so I, I, there, there is a challenge in, in the mismatch, or well, it's not a mismatch, it's just that there's a different perspective between private actors investing in technolo technology change in long-term assets and public markets and public instruments that are seeking to do something else and somehow we need to bring the piece together but we would see that as being the role of a sort of partnership discussion. 
And so build, building on that, there are a few questions around how one can assess um, using more qualitative factors, um, you know, companies um, progress on, you know, it, be it things like investing in technologies, but other, other uh, qualitative factors um, as part of your assessment of their, their progress um, on, on climate change. Chris, would you like to say that? Yeah, I mean, uh, sure. It's it's uh, it's obviously more challenging because of the comparability of the data. Uh, in our own methodology, with regards to um, um, the Glide Path score and how we're analyzing companies in terms of um, climate risk, we tend to use their qualitative disclosures as a way of verifying the. Um, the quality of the data itself. So we are looking for commitments uh, by companies to reduce CO2 emissions, evidence that they have made investments in place. Um, and we use that uh, as an, an element in gaining greater confidence in the reported data and metrics that they're using. Um, but we don't use it as a factor in um, weighting companies um, themselves in the strategy because we've got enough data we now have enough historical data that we can actually look at the performance metrics and and base most of our assessments around that i would yeah, say that uh, you know Go the ahead. only thing to add there is i think there's some interesting uh data sets coming available uh, as a result of tcfd so it's improving the quality of reported metrics and standardizing a bit more the way companies are providing qualitative data. And uh, the CDP has now um, got questions aligned to TCFD, which is very helpful in standardizing the approaches the way companies report on this. Francis? Uh, yeah, and so that, you know, good, good points there in terms of where um, this qualitative um, sort of source of data is going. There's, there's two places I think I wanted to uh, to mention here, one one of them is that we will certainly use qualitative information when it comes to stru structuring our engagement program um, with uh, companies on climate change transition. So it's not that's not just about uh, um, quali quantitative data. What we're getting into in the engagements is very much the qualitative aspects of of governance of the strategy discussion. Um, and um, and plans associated with it um, of target setting um, and how does that that run through ultimately to, to sort of uh, improve disclosure and it also comes up again in, in a, it's an initiative that we're associated with um, and where we do use information um, uh, in our engagements and that's a transition pathway initiative um, which is well worth a look in terms of how they're measuring the, the two degree alignment of um, the targets being set by companies in different sectors. Um, and they do that, they do, and they'll, they'll look at what's called the, the climate performance, so they'll, they'll look at the company and its, and its, its forward looking trajectory. And they'll also look at the quality of management. So they have a management performance indicator. And that's another example of a very helpful, very useful um, uh, uh, qualitative information that investors can use. The, the limitation with the transition pathway in this initiative is it goes deep, but it's not, it's not, it could be broader in terms of its, um, its use across a sort of an investment uh, arena, but it's a very, very interesting um, initiative one that we're, we are happy to support. I have a question. A few questions are coming around sort of specific industries and you know your views around um, some of the technology sectors. So things like um, you know uh, the fiber infrastructure, um, regional data centers, you know, to technology assets that that, that are potentially. Um, uh, beneficiaries in, in, from this trend, um, or similarly, you know, biofuels and biorefining. You know, are there particular sectors that you point to as being, you know, interesting and, and attractive in, in this climate? Um, yeah, I mean, I think there are 
there are interesting areas in, a, in sort of a wide range of sectors. And, and what's interesting is when you get deeper into individual sectors, of course, there's, there's, each one has its own set of climate risks, um, be that heavy carbon intensity or the carbon intensity of suppliers or um, some sort of regulation or, or standard setting that, that, that might change their business. So every sector has its different flavor of climate transition risk. Um, but they also have their own connection to climate change and their potential role in being solutions. And one of the really interesting things about you know the fundamentals that we talked about at the top of the conversation um, is 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 that process of getting deeper into individual sectors and art and, and art, art, uh, answering those kind of questions. I'm I don't feel equipped to talk about uh, data centres and um, but. You know, when you when when you look at some of the sectors I look at, the the energy sector, yet biofuels has its has its part to play. Um, how you scale that up is a really interesting question. And is it that we need to have uh, smaller uh, companies going it alone in terms of um, biofuel uh, development, or you know, here's here's possibly a role for oil and gas companies in terms of what do you do with um, Oil refining capacity going forward. So, uh, it, it, but it's but these are examples of a number of really interesting questions which apply, you know, it, it, within individual industry groups. The only thing I would add there is that we see a huge interest from institutional investors, particularly with uh, passive asset allocations, to not make sector bets but to reorient their allocations within sectors, depending on the trajectory, the profile, the transition path of companies. Um, and so one of the things that we've done in the climate aware strategies um, in equities, and now we're applying it to fixed income, is not to um, make big sector bets, but to re-weight and reorient the companies in favor of companies that are on the right trajectory or glide path and transition path and underweight companies at higher risk for climate change. Um, and it allows for strategies with um, relatively low levels of risk vis-a-vis -vis the benchmarks that nonetheless make a big difference in terms of the carbon climate risk. Um, and therefore, it's much easier uh, for clients to make quite significant shifts of their pass that, passive assets into low carbon strategies with that approach. And I think um, sometimes there's a, a view that a low carbon strategy requires making significant sector bets, but there's a lot of innovative approaches now um, of reweighting and reorienting companies within sectors. Because if you look at the um, both the levels of CO2 emissions, but also the ability for companies to reorient their strategies, there's major differences in virtually across every sector. Um, so I would just point that out that that's one of the areas where we see probably the, the biggest area of interest from institutional clients in applying this to their passive um, asset allocation. We could. One final question, if, if I may. Um, obviously, in the current climate, there's a huge amount of focus on, on the coronavirus and its impact on, on societies and on the economy. What do you think we should take away from that, from sustaining for, the, for this agenda? Are there any lessons that will be learned? Are there any sort of near-term implications um, in, in your mind? Um, yeah, I mean, a bit, I would be a bit wary of drawing too many conclusions on where we are in COVID-19 because I think there are still, you know, developments to come. We've got um, uh, we've, we've got some way to go, perhaps before um, before we've peaked and before we've um, seen through the economic consequences here. So, but I think I would draw a couple of distinctions. Um, COVID-19 uh, coronavirus pandemic is sort of an acute uh, issue that has significance for, you know, the availability of human resources and, and in our economies and places huge strain on the capacity of social services, for instance, healthcare. Um, and we're contrasting that to, um, for instance, a, a, a sort of disorderly um, uh, um, 
uh, response to to climate change, so that, which is sort of something more of a chronic um, problem. So they're, they're different in those sorts of characteristics. But um, this is sort of asking a question about how all sorts of things in the economic setup need to be thought about in terms of capacity and bottlenecks and fairness of access and the security of supply chains um, and so on. So I think perhaps that might be the, one of the areas that um, where um, coronavirus connects to to climate change and perhaps um, secondly it sort of shows the need given, given that there has been talk about epidemic risks in the past um, but the actual source and timing of emergence has been difficult to predict in the case of climate change we have a good idea what's driving it or accentuating it and a reasonable idea of the consequences so perhaps this um, also shows the need for um, greater forward-thinking risk assessment and action. Well, let's hope so. That will be a, a positive thought to, to conclude on. Um, so thank you, Chris and Francis, uh, for your time, and thank you all for listening. I'll, I'll hand back over to Dom to, to wrap up. Thanks, James, and, and thanks, guys. Yes, um, apologies. I know we've had a lot of questions, and I thank James for condensing some of them into uh, into some you know, quite snappy questions that we could cover a lot of ground on this. Um, we will be producing a lot more free content over the next month. Um, we've got a white paper coming out next week, ESG leadership in the USA. Um, we'll have two more webinars across April, ESG in emerging markets. And then, of course, we're going to be doing one on uh, ESG in the midst of COVID-19. Obviously, we touched a little bit on it at the end there, but we'll be, you know, delving more into the depths of these topics throughout the month. But just finally, um, thank you to our panellists, uh, James, Chris and Francis, and thank you to everyone for listening in.